the City of Waterloo, in cooperation with its many active and inspiring entities, presents Heart for the City, a chance to hear and see what's going on in our city and to meet people who serve you, teach you, entertain you, help you, all neighbors and like you. Make this a city on the move. And now, here's our host, the Honorable Quentin Hart. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us on Heart for the City. I'm Quentin Hart, proud mayor of Waterloo. What is going on in our great city? So much, and we are only able to reveal just a fraction of it on each show. But before we get started, we have some late breaking news and an announcement uh, that's coming directly from our executive director of our Human Rights Commission, Abraham Funches, with some important dates. On Thursday, February 27th at 6.30 p.m., there is at Cedar Valley Unitarian Universalist at 3912 Cedar Heights Drive, Cedar Falls, Iowa, a sex trafficking in our backyard workshop. And you can join others in the Cedar Valley who are concerned about sex trafficking by attending this event. And you will, you will view the film, Any Kid, Anywhere, which was produced by the Junior League of the Quad Cities. And it's specifically talking about trafficking in Iowa. We'll also have a panel discussion with Ms. Shoshita Thomas from the Friends of the Family, Inc will follow and the panel will include at least one person who has survived sex trafficking and Sergeant Jared Ebregest uh, from the Iowa Department of Transportation will be there as well and that is February 27th at 6 30 p.m. but also on March 9th the UNI 7 uh, will be honored at the University of Northern Iowa and on April 4th remember that date April 4th uh, we have Ayanna Gregory, who is the daughter or granddaughter of Dick Gregory, who will be, uh, I think, at First Congregational uh, Church as well. But all this information uh, can be found on our Human Rights Commission uh, website. And remember, the Human Rights Commission is a body of dedicated members set up to make compliance and education a meaningful and visible strategy working towards the elimination of the effects of discriminatory practices in the city of Waterloo. Uh, for more information on this, be sure to visit their website, which can be found on the city's homepage or call 319-291-4441 on any issue that involves your rights. And remember, the commission is located at 620 Mulberry Street, and the office is open between 8 o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. All right, so moving on, here's what is coming up on this program. We'll have a look at an entity that is housed in a 165,000 square foot building on 54 acres. And we will get insight uh, into this all important aspects of city finance. And lastly, we will discover why our city is the first Iowa bird friendly city along with our coveted long-term status as Tree City USA. It's all coming up after this. Welcome to the Waterloo Regional Airport. Waterloo Regional Airport is served by American Airlines with daily flights to Chicago O'Hare and connections anywhere in the world. Our airport offers convenient and easy access, fast security lines, $6 daily parking, and comfortable passenger waiting areas. Whether you're traveling for business or pleasure, fly ALO. Visit us online to book a flight or to check our flight schedule. Fly with us today. Getting healthy has never been easier with a membership at Cedar Valley Sportsplex. Offering 80 free classes a week at all skill levels, there's always new and fun opportunities to grow. You never have to miss out on your favorites with our state-of-the-art facilities, featuring great exercise equipment, a track and field, pool, and two regulation gyms. So whether your game is football or pickleball, let the Cedar Valley Sportsplex turn your routine into something amazing. The Isle Casino Hotel didn't happen overnight. It took the planning, preparation, and petitioning and significant lobbying by several dedicated citizens to make it happen. The casino hosts over 1,000 slot machines, 
25 table games and sports betting through a partnership with William Hill Sportsbook in its 37,442 square feet gaming area. But the aisle is more than just gaming. And to tell us about the many non-gaming facts and activities is Thomas Roberts, the Vice President and General Manager of the Isle Casinos Hotel. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. So before you move to the most greatest city <laughs> uh, in the entire world, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. You know, I, I started off in this business when I was 21 years old. Um, as a as a bar back working for a, a bartender that actually later on in life became my wife uh, we uh, we met in Louisiana I'm from Mississippi she's from Shreveport and we worked our way all the way through the Midwest and um, you know, we were down in Shreveport Louisiana about the time the economy really went south and, and a job opportunity really came available here in Waterloo and it um, they flew my wife up and myself up and we were like this is where we want to be Wow, that, that's an incredible, incredible uh, story. Well, next show we're going to have to dive into right. that a little <laughs> bit more. Um, but, but we know um, that the, the, the aisle is more than just uh, slot machines and gaming. Tell us, tell us what else is uh, available there other than non-wagering. Sure. You know, when you think about restaurants and a place to go out to eat, it, we're, we're, we built that casino as a part of how do you do how do you develop an entertainment body where you can go and have food drinks stay the night spend the night if you want to gamble you can but there's so much more to do um, recently we put a hundred and sixty thousand dollar arcade right next to the pool um, as a way because we have people that come in with their families and instead of leaving kids or or splitting the parents up and one's in the hotel room and one's out on the gaming floor that there's a place where they can go swim and they can play the arcade games as well well, that is, that's incredible, um, you know, because when you think about it, it's about the experience. And it's a place, I think we were just talking a few seconds ago, it's very cold outside. Right. Uh, so everything that you can possibly want and need is located directly there. So I hadn't had a chance to see the arcade, but I'm pretty sure I got some uh, some, some young as that. <laughs> it's pretty nice because we started selling pool passes. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to come in, you can actually go stay in the pool during the middle of the day for $5. You can come in and go swimming. You can go play at the arcade so mm -hmm. on a cold day or on spring break or when there's nothing really going on and you right. want to get out you can actually go up there and, and relax and as a parent you know there's food and there's and there's a place to go hang out as well and you know also uh, you have event space too right, right. Um, from the conferences and many different right. things you, you, whether it's uh, sometimes we have a lot of charitable um, groups come in and they'll use our ballroom sometimes John Deere j different groups that come mm -hmm. along the way and they um, they'll rent out our space. Sometimes we donate it away to the right organization to, to help them raise money for their organization as well. And I know you've already touched on this really briefly, but the food is outstanding. Right. Uh, oh my God. We, got a, well, we have a great steakhouse. I haven't eaten. The, I haven't eaten yet today, <laughs> so I was thinking about that buffet right now. Well, we, I guess it was about a year ago we put in Brew Brothers, which right. was about uh, it's a 1.1 million dollar investment. Um, right at the front door. So when you come in, you can get pasta, you can get a uh, burger, you can get steak. Mm -hmm. um, upstairs, we have a fabulous steakhouse that's open Friday and Saturday right. night. And then for those who can't get enough, there's always the buffet. And the pastries, <laughs> too. Anyway, I'm sorry. I just got <laughs> caught up in the moment. But um, but also, that's on the that portion of it. But uh, can you tell what the Blackhawk County Gaming Association is and what their relationship to the hotel? Sure, the, the Blackhawk Gaming, uh, the Blackhawk County Gaming Association actually is our license holder. So, mm -hmm. when Iowa set up the uh, the charitable organizations to work with the casinos, they really did it in the right way. In the South, if you've got a casino, it's your responsibility to do the, the grant giving and the donations to the town. Mm -hmm. um, the way Iowa set it up is there's a charitable organization tied to your license mm -hmm. so that as we as a company, we, we supply 5% of our gaming revenue to the Blackhawk Gaming Association and they distribute the grant. So when people come to us and they're like, can you do this or can we do this? Some of those things we can do. Free, you know, sometimes it's a complimentary hotel room that they want to auction off. But the bigger things like replace the roof on a library down in Grundy, you know, those things actually come from the Black Hawk Gaming Association wow. where they have the, the funds that are accumulated to do. Yeah, and, and the impact that it's had on our local community has been absolutely incredible. Uh, if you take a look at um, things that are happening in downtown Waterloo, 
um, it has really made a huge impact. And then the social services is incredible. You know, I was fortunate many, many moons ago prior to uh, being mayor uh, to, to be blessed to receive a, a grant uh, for the From the Heart program, and we were able to probably do about 50 houses locally for uh, low-income, elderly, and physically disabled people. So, you know, it has been an incredible partnership and relationship. And the the um, the hotel was built when and how much was an, an investment was that? 2007, oh um, right at uh, 100, 101 point million um, as the initial investment. That's for the building. <clears throat> then you had to fill it with slot machines, cooking equipment, beds, and things like that. So um, the, it can be, it can, the price tag can go up. But if you, what we spent on our property was $1.1 million. Or right. excuse me, $100.1 million. Wow. Uh, I can't wait for that expansion. Oh, yeah. it's not. A, oh, I'm sorry. We're just. I'm, I'm speaking it. It, it would existence. be nice. <laughs> and then, um, in addition to that, um, you actually employ people. How many employees do you have? Right now, we have 398 employees, wow. um, and with 30 open positions. Uh, so we're constantly going out looking for ways to get new people in and and getting people back to work uh, and to come up join us at the aisle. We pay 25 percent above minimum just to start. Uh, most jobs that we have in our building, you won't find a job that doesn't start at least at ten dollars an hour wow and then um, the the um, the earnings what are their earnings again so they're invested in the local community so we <coughs> we give about five percent or we give we do give five percent back to the um, Black Hawk Ga County Gaming Association right. so when you think about that the last year was 4.9 million dollars in 2019 that mm -hmm. was our last check oh, wow. and then it can vary depending on if the revenues are up or the revenue right. is down Right, and and when those we we mentioned a little bit earlier about the granting portion is a competitive process, right? Right. So if anybody's looking to get a grant, they'll go to the website for Blackhawk Gaming, uh, Blackhawk County Gaming Association, and and they'll put in what they want to do. And usually, the 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 way those grants work and the way they're handed out is really to help, you know, those projects that are publicly funded mm -hmm. or were publicly funded. So. We don't have to raise taxes on the right. citizens. Those actually are now coming through the Black Hawk Gaming Association. So they don't always fund 100% of a project. The, the person who's looking has to find the money, at least half of that money, somewhere else, okay. um, which actually puts skin in the, in the game for everybody. Right. And it seems, you know, you, you know, as we talk about the overall investment from jobs to wagering to non-wagering to uh, the social impact, it seems like everyone wants a, a <laughs> casino. Right. Every town wants one. Uh, but can you tell me, um, is there, you know, I know the, the State Gaming Commission really thoroughly goes through this, and I think the word they use sometimes, or people use, is saturation. Can right. you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, you know, when, when uh, and the most recent one is when uh, Cedar Rapids was, was trying mm -hmm. to get a casino into, into their um, into their town and and the challenge is is that they're focused right between two cities and right. when Waterloo bid on it 12 years ago mm -hmm. we 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 put bricks and mortar here in this town and there was a lot of investment that went on when Riverside built one down in south of Iowa City they did the same thing mm -hmm. and what they what we worry about sometimes is does a market or what the gaming commission worries about is does the market can it get new revenue right. or is it just going to pull away from the other ones right. if the studies that we did, if we actually would have, if that would have gone in that market, we would have actually decreased our business up to 17%. Wow. And if we would have lost 17% <coughs> of our business, then you lose 17% of your employees. You lose 17% of everything. Right. And and I don't know if that's good when you look at the state. It wouldn't have impacted. I think Riverside was about 50%. Yeah, so when they look at it, away. Yeah, it, it's really to figure out how does, is this going to help the community or is it going to pull away from other communities? Right, right. Okay, okay. Well, uh, you know, Thomas, thank you so much for taking time out of what must be a very active <laughs> schedule to come here and talk with us. Um, Waterloo is proud to have the Isle Casino Hotel located in our city which provides employment entertainment along with sizable contributions to many local worthwhile uh, projects and that was Thomas Roberts vice president and general manager from the Isle Casino Hotel and in 2003 Bob Fulton Jim Lynn and Don Hoff uh, started a petition to hold a referendum in Blackhawk County to approve what at that time was called an excursion gaming boat. 
Uh, they found it, the Blackhawk County Gaming Association, is a nonprofit holder of a gaming license. And later, in 2003, voters approved the project in a referendum by 66.3%. And in October 2005, a groundbreaking ceremony was held. And in August the same year, the Blackhawk County Gaming Association began accepting applications for funding, property tax relief, capital improvements, and charitable contributions. And currently, applications for funding are accepted on a quarterly basis since, since its inception. And through the Gaming Commission, the Owl Casino Hotel has made charitable contributions totaling $48.7 million. And continuing on, the City of Waterloo has income streams to support city functions to pay for personnel and keep current on financial obligations. With an annual budget over $163 million, how are all the financial activities managed? <clears throat> we will be talking to someone with the answers right after this. If we know what to throw into our recycling container, we're taking a simple step towards being a better recycler. You should always recycle flattened cardboard, metal cans, and plastic bottles and jugs with the lids on. By breaking down your cardboard boxes and placing each item in the container individually, it makes them easier to process and leaves more room for other recyclables. And by avoiding contaminated items like plastic bags and greasy pizza boxes, it ensures that we can make a positive difference in our homes, our communities, and our world. Learn more on how to become a better recycler at RecyclingSimplified.com. When I ride my bike, I am always very careful and stay safe at all times. I always wear a properly fitted helmet. I check the safety lights in the front and back of my bike. And no matter where I ride, I keep an eye out for cars, even when riding on the sidewalk. This message is brought to you by Drive Safe Cedar Valley. For over 19 years, Michelle Wiedner has been responsible for managing budgets over $150 million, working and advising on debt issues, as well as capital and economic development projects. She also oversees general financing and accounting practices. She is responsible for auditing and preparing the comprehensive annual financial reports in accordance with the Government Accounting Standards Board. The GASB is an independent, nonprofit organization whose goal is to comprehensively assess the overall financial health of a city. The real expert on this is our city CFO, not CF, no, not CF, no CFO, <laughs> Michelle Wiedner. So, uh, welcome to Heart for the City. This is your first visit, and thanks for making the long trip downstairs to the <laughs> studio. Thank you. I'm taking time out of the budget to help you out. <laughs> you, you, you all don't know how much of a pleasure it is today <laughs> to have uh, Michelle because normally uh, she's way behind the scenes, uh, busy working, but it's a great opportunity to have a dialogue, and especially around budget season, so people would know what's uh, going on. But prior to being the CFO for the City of Waterloo, can you tell us a little bit about your background? I can, so probably going to tell you more than you wanted to know. I'm actually a farm girl, grew up around Sioux City, Iowa, and I attended Iowa Girls State at the University of Northern Iowa, and that's how I got interested in UNI and then came here and graduated with a degree in accounting from UNI. I went to work at a local accounting firm and became a partner there. I was there for about 17 years, and I was real involved in the community the Chamber of Commerce and Rotary and a lot of other organizations and then an opening came up at the city they really needed some help in accounting so I decided to try a new adventure and I've been here 19 years now. Well 19 plus 14 or 17 <laughs> you must have started right when you were doing 2 plus 2 and two. 4 yeah. plus 4 in <laughs> <Yeah>. schools. <laughs> but um, tell us what, what are the primary primary objectives of the finance department? Our primary goal is really to provide sound financial procedures and policies for all our departments to follow. We want our citizens to feel confident that their money is being 
appropriately spent and accounted for. Because if they're not, people let us know if they, they think they're not. They certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how many people are actually in the finance department and what are some of the broad range of things they do? So right now I have three and another part-time person that help us with the accounting. Um, we handle all the banking activities for the city and that's one person's almost full-time job to track all that and make sure the revenue is getting to the right fund. Um, for those of you who are familiar with governments, we actually operate about 30 different, I would term them like 30 different businesses, so 30 different funds that we need to track all the revenue and expenses and make sure they get in the right pot. So one person does that. Um, we review all the invoices that are paid by the city to make sure that we've received the information, that whatever we're paying for, that it's appropriate. Um, you can ask employees. We only allow things that are for a public purpose, so you will not see people being able to buy things for themselves and mm. that those kind of things we monitor. So that's kind of where the CF no comes in sometimes. Unfortunately, sometimes we are the department that has to say, no, you can't do that uh, because it's, it's not publicly accepted that it's for a public purpose. Um, we also work with providing good financial accounting, both to our departments and to our citizens. Um, the primary thing with our citizens is we do provide what the mayor called our comprehensive annual financial report, and I brought one. That is also available on the city website. There's lots of good information in it um, that can tell you about our city. If you're really wanting to know, you're welcome to look at that. And I, and I know some of the questions I may ask may be a little bit redundant because we want, we want people to get it and to truly understand uh, the importance of the overall office. And we know that uh, finance is, of course, the, the management of uh, large amounts of money, especially by governments or large companies, but uh, the services that are responsible for in managing the city's money. Um, can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Um, so or did we already? We, we kind, we of, kind already. of covered it. I probably jumped ahead a little bit, but in terms of managing our money, we have to make sure that there's always enough cash in the right account to make payroll for, in the summertime, up to 800 employees. Mm -hmm. Also, our debt payments, um, we do have to borrow money. I always relate it to having a mortgage. Most of us can't buy our house with cash, so we have a mortgage that we make payments on. We, we do that annually. Um, so we do try to, ha we're also limits on how much we should invest in, or not invest, but deposit in certain banks. Right. We try to use a variety and there's just a lot into it to make sure the cash flow is right. And it's, it's interesting you said annually because every year we have this process that we use to develop a budget. So can you tell us a little bit about your role in the, the development of the budget for the year? So fi the finance department really provides coordination and technical assistance with creating the budget. We have about probably 16 now departments who all have professional staff and department heads who develop their own budgets. While we support them and we help them uh, make sure their numbers are right, they really are presenting the budgets. So we coordinate all that. We make sure that we're following state law so that we're not um, taxing more than we're allowed to, for example, because there's all kinds of things in state law about what you can and can't do. So. Our job is to really help support all the people with their programs. And then, you know, we have this large budget, but the large budget is also compromised of uh, different sources of income. Yep. So can you talk a little bit about the different sources and what is the largest source of income we have? Really cities are, our city particularly is funded with a lot of different sources. Mm -hmm. Only 29% of our total budget is property taxes, which people are often surprised to hear that because that's what we concentrate on a lot. Another about 6% comes from tax increment financing revenue, and that is a special kind of revenue that allows us to develop projects to draw more people and homes into the city. Then. Charges for services is actually another large category, about 19% of our budget. So that's actually people paying a fee for the service that they're receiving, such as your sewer, garbage, other, right. might, you might get a permit for your house if you're going to build a new house or add on to it, things like that. Okay. And, um, you, you know, what's interesting, we always hear about uh, levy. So uh, can you try to explain? 
explain the levy portion? Yes, yeah, so I'll try not to talk in accountant <laughs> speak. So levies is really, that's a term that was created by state government. Mm -hmm. That's how they specify how we are allowed to tax an individual. Mm -hmm. So a property tax levy in state language just says how much a city can levy for a certain type of expense. Okay. And what's interesting, when you, we, we always think about it, I mean, we're going to have to do a show where we have you on just for like the entire time because <laughs> we're just barely scratching the surface. But before we, before we conclude, there was one, one thing that I want to talk about uh, and people understand, you know, when you take a look at the city's finances, um, your financial health has an impact over your bonds and stuff. So it can does. you tell us tell us a little bit about bonds and, and those things? Yes, so the way that cities generally borrow money, the mortgage on your house, so to speak, for a city, we issue something called general obligation bonds. And so people, or generally in, investors, and a lot of times they're institutional, which means banks or mm -hmm pension plans, those kind of things, purchase our debt. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways they measure whether they want to risk investing in us is by our bond rating. So over the time I've been here, we've been able to improve our bond rating several rankings, probably think mm -hmm. about three or four. So we are now at what's called an AA2. We are evaluated annually by Moody's Investor Services for that. That puts us at a very high rating. It's just two notches from the very best you can get. Um, and that would be like the federal government would be so, the largest. So it's kind of like our overall credit score that is, uh, for that the is city. What it is. And they're able yeah. to, um, you know, borrow money for specific things based upon uh, your fiscal help. So yes. we only scratched the surface today. Uh, but, you know, I want to thank you, Michelle, for taking time out of uh, your very busy schedule. Uh, bu budget activities had started. Do you hear that bell like ding, ding, ding? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's clanging because, yeah, there's a lot to do. <laughs> and, and I know you want to get back to it, but uh, you're the resource person that I depend on most heavily on matters concerning finances. So thank you for being the backbone in this area of city management. And that's Michelle Weidner, Chief Financial Officer of the City of Waterloo, so thank you. As Chief Financial Officer, Michelle has broad authority within our government. As the, chi as the city's chief bookkeeper, she must promote transparency, efficient efficiency, and accountability. Her financial expertise is invaluable in ensuring citizens get the most out of their tax dollars. At council meetings, Michelle is often asked to explain a simple, concise manner what is often a complex financial situation, and she has never failed to accomplish this. The CFO is tasked with making sure that explanatory text, tables, charts, and footnotes will make sense to people without a financial background. And we should all be thankful that we have an individual who is as dedicated as Michelle and her staff for the multitude of different tasks that are necessary to attend to the city financial affairs. And it all must be accurate and it is subject to public scrutiny. Uh, but by the way, the city has received an award from the Government Finance Officers Association for its comprehensive annual financial report for excellence in financial reporting. And this is the organization's highest recognition, which Waterloo has received for 14 consecutive years. Again, Michelle Wiedner, Chief Financial Officer of the City of Waterloo, thank you. And moving on, an earth-friendly city Waterloo has parks and hiking trails which are fundamental when it comes to green space and eco-friendly design. Studies have proven that access to green spaces helps to reduce anxiety and depression, provides a habitat for wildlife, contributes to cleaner air, to moderating temperatures, uh, trapping carbon and producing oxygen. I know you knew that I knew all of this. <laughs> but Waterloo has 1,100 acres green belt within city limits and it includes an eight mile stretch of Blackhawk Creek, a prairie, couple of lakes, and miles for trail for biking, trails, hiking, and cross-country skiing, which I'm going to have to try. And one of the lakes, Greenbelt Lake, has a largemouth bass, catfish, bluegills, and crappies. Uh, this 20-acre lake is located on the north side of Martin Road, just west of Highway 63. And there is some great news for people using Waterloo's premier natural area. 
More on that after this. There's a place that lies directly between where you've been and where you're going. It's the place in the middle, the place where your past and future connect. Hawkeye Community College is that place, connecting you to great faculty, engaged students, and four-year destinations like the University of Northern Iowa. Every masterpiece starts with a blank canvas, and every success story begins with an empty page. Start writing your story today. Hawkeye Community College. Connect. Waterloo is the first bird-friendly community in Iowa. Our community has shown that birds are an important part of a healthy ecosystem and critical to quality of life. Waterloo has partnered with the Prairie Rapids Audubon Society to make this designation possible. To tell us about this partnership is Tom Schilke, president of Prairie Rapids Audubon Society. So welcome. Hey, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Uh, t Tom, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved with, with birds and the Audubon Society. Sure. I've, I've always been interested in nature. I came from the state of Wisconsin, got a job in Oskaloosa as a music teacher, but kept that nature part of my life um, active. I moved here to Waterloo in 1984, and in 1997 I decided I want to learn the birds. Mm -hmm. So when you want to learn <clears throat> things, you go hang around with people that know. Right. So I went to the Audubon Society and uh, started going on some of the field trips they were doing, going to some of the me uh, meetings. And being an educator in Waterloo, they asked me to uh, be part of the board. And then I became vice president and helped with education parts of the Audubon and uh, now president. And where were you, uh, you said education, where were you? Um, I was uh, in a number of schools in Waterloo, Central High at first till they okay. closed, and then I uh, ended up at Hoover Middle School. In and Orange I, I just Orange. wanted to hear you say Hoover, give my wife a shout out. All right, she, good, her, good school. <laughs> Mrs. Hart over there, vice principal, <laughs> and, uh, Mr. Schmidt, the principal. So I just, sorry, that was shameless. Wonderful that school. was That was uh, my fault. <laughs> All right, the, um, the Prairie Rapids Audubon Society um, had named Waterloo as a bird-friendly city. And how was this award determined? It's a new program for the state, and uh, they were asking f uh, the, the Bird Friendly Iowa Committee, where, where they were looking for uh, um, volunteer organizations and cities to pilot the program. And I looked at the criteria, 30 different criteria for, uh, um, for birds. I saw that, you know, Waterloo was a perfect candidate for this. So we volunteered and, uh, to help pilot the program and knowing that we would become, we would qualify. And so I met with uh, Paul Hutting, and then he uh, designated uh, Todd Deerfield um, as the project coordinator. We met together, went through all the criteria together, and I, we learned from each other. Uh, they found out, Todd found out things that we were doing as, as an organization that benefited the community, and we found out things that the city was doing. And together, he filled out the application, turned it in, and we were the first selected, and it really had been uh, kind of a model for other right. other uh, cities to look at. And um, I think the through the uh, Iowa DNR, uh, we received a two hundred thousand uh, dollar reap award that mm -hmm. was for um, the the Katoski area, Katoski right. Greenbelt. So, can you tell us a little bit for, about that first phase and what's happening overall? Sure. That's the REAP program with mm -hmm. the Resource Enhancement and Protection Act. It's a competitive grant process, mm -hmm. very competitive. And uh, so um, when the city decided to turn in that grant, they contacted us for some additional information. So we collaborated uh, on that park. We use it as a, it's a really a great park for birding and for mm -hmm. hiking. Um, it has a lot of diversity in the, in the habitat that's there. 
and it's known for owls and some other rare birds and people for come who? from all for over. Who? Owls, no, yeah. For <laughs> and know, people they, come from around the state, really, when there's a rare bird there to, to, to you know, take a look at it. So we helped with the with that uh, application a little bit, provided some information, and it scored really high, and he got two hundred thousand dollars. And I was just thinking, the next time we do this interview, we need to be there. Okay, sure. We need to, we need to be uh, right there. And uh, there's a four-acre uh, pollinator that will be. Um, I think it's to the west, west of the lake maybe. Yes. Can you tell us about uh, this and what will be accomplished from doing this? Sure. This is a, um, be a native planting with 54 native um, species of prairie plants mm -hmm. mostly. So and again with this collaboration with Bird Friendly, um, Todd contacted us and we went out there to take a look at it. Which trees should we keep? How should we develop? What should we leave? What can we remove? And uh, and still maintain the integrity of the area for uh, for birds. So we know pollinators are important. Um, birds need insects for for nesting for the protein. So it'll be a win-win situation. It's going to go from a basic field to a native prairie. It'll enhance the insects and bees, and also will be a better habitat for a grassland species of birds. Well, you know, you, you 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 know, you mentioned Todd and and your abilities to be able to work together. Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. um, there are other organizations too that are helping with natural um, wildlife here, right? Can you name a few of those? Yeah, um, there's a number of, of of groups, statewide groups mm -hmm. too, that um, have people that belong close by. Nature Conservancy, Iowa Ornithologist Union, Native Plant Society, Sierra Club. All those welcome people that are interested in nature, and I encourage people to get involved and then and hang again, hang around with people that know things. Iowa Prairie Network is another one, mm -hmm. Native Plant Society, I think I mentioned. Well, I'm going to have to read this question because sure. I know in 2015, um, Orange Elementary received, uh, was awarded a, a grant by the <coughs> Prairie Rapids Audubon mm -hmm. Society, but mm -hmm. I need to read the name. Sure. <laughs> but it was for Iowa. Ornithologist Union right. to build two chimney swift towers. Right. So can you tell me about that? Sure. Um, the Prairie Rapids Audubon right now we're in the middle of our grant cycle. So we we um, give grants for uh, educational projects uh, to our six county area to nature centers and such. And Orange applied for um, um, a chimney swift tower. The old Orange building. The old chimney there was a great spot for um, chimney swifts. Over 200 would use the use the facility. So we provided money, and and the Iowa Ornithologist Union did. They built two towers. They've been very successful. Each one has had nesting um, birds each year, which is pretty unusual. And kids help out with that and wow. help build them. And it's a, it's a great school for environmental education out there doing a lot of wonderful things. Wow. And from there to uh, the city city of Waterloo being named as Tree City USA by the, the National Arbor Day uh, Foundation, uh, can you, that's a huge honor. Um, can you talk about that for people as well? Sure. Well, you know, that like being a tree city is, and is like being a bird, bird city. It's a process. Mm -hmm. You agree to make a commitment to make your community better. Right. As you mentioned about our green belts and mm -hmm. our um, native plantings and stuff that help wildlife. And it's just great for, for our, our own mental welfare mm -hmm. to, be out, to be outside. So I guess that's a process again. Uh, the, the bird friendly, was there's 30 criteria. We met eight of them at least. And each year we try to improve do something a little, a little bit better. Same with the Tree City. Mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not a stagnant award. It's right. something you work towards improving every year. And, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely important, you know, prior to becoming mayor or on council, you know, you just don't know all of the terrific things taking place. And, you know, being fortunate enough to live in Waterloo, to live in the state of Iowa, uh, we have an opportunity to tap into so much of the beautiful nature uh, that we have to, to make those uh, just, just things that people want to go to. I served on the Great Places Board, you know, for several years, and I had the opportunity to travel around the state and start to see the transition and the push for the biking and for the trail system. So it gives me a completely 
um, different perspective than I had uh, years ago. But if people are interested in finding out more information, whether it's about birds or trees, uh, how, wh how would they be able to contact someone? I think there's uh, two good ways. One on the, the City of Waterloo website has a link for awards, mm -hmm. and one is uh, Bird Friendly Community. Yep. So you type on that and you can get uh, um, what to plant in your yard, what sp uh, native species are good for certain parts of birds, and also our Prairie Rapids Audubon website, which is gopras, um, G-O-P-R-A-S mm -hmm. dot org. Um, there's a number of links to organizations, photographers, events that are going on for, for birds, and I always say we're, we're all in this together, whether yeah. we're hikers or bikers or whatever, we would like to be out where it's a you know, pleasant habitat and uh, for, for the birds and the wildlife mm -hmm. and for, again, for our own mental welfare. Just All right, All right. Well, well, thanks so much, Tom, uh, for spending time uh, with us and explaining the benefits of our natural environment as it relates to native animals and plants. And there is so much more that we can say, uh, but birds provide many services to keep our ecological system in balance. And as you indicated, birds help in uh, plant dispersal as they spread seeds. Hummingbirds transport pollen on uh, their beaks and feathers from one flower to the next. And some birds also help in controlling the rodent population. And I suggest that whether you want to become a birder or not, joining the Audubon Society is a low cost way to show support uh, for our environment. So I want to thank you, Tom, and for all all of you and the members of the Audubon Society uh, for what you do for our citizens and the appreciation of the natural world. So Tom Schelke, President, Prairie Rapids Audubon Society again, our thanks. The National Audubon Society is a nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to conservation, located in the United States and incorporated in 1905. Audubon is one of the oldest of such organizations in the world and uses science, education, and grassroots advocacy to advance its conservation mission. Audubon's mission is to conserve and restore natural ecosystems, or ecosystems like I called it earlier, <laughs> but focusing on birds and other uh, wildlife and their habitats for the benefit of humanity and the Earth's biological diversity. So don't go away. We'll be right back. If we know what to throw into our recycling container, we're taking a simple step towards being a better recycler. You should always recycle flattened cardboard, metal cans, and plastic bottles and jugs with the lids on. By breaking down your cardboard boxes and placing each item in the container individually, it makes them easier to process and leaves more room for other recyclables. And by avoiding contaminated items like plastic bags and greasy pizza boxes, it ensures that we can make a positive difference in our homes, our communities, and our world. Learn more on how to become a better recycler at RecyclingSimplified.com. Well, that's our show. Looking for something to do for entertainment, shopping, eating, and more? Go to ExperienceWaterloo.com for complete listings of so many exciting activities, places, and venues. And be sure to check the Main Street website, and that's www.MainStreetWaterloo.org. We have much going on in downtown Waterloo, including exciting annual events, which you won't want to miss. And consider the many opportunities to be a part of Main Street by volunteering. And we welcome your suggestions and feedback. And remember to tell others that these episodes are available for viewing from the City of Waterloo website, and that's cityofwaterlooiowa.com, and search for Heart for the City. And be sure to like us on Facebook. Please join us next time, and thanks for watching Heart for the City. Until then, I think you'll agree, it's a great day to be in Waterloo.